This edifice starts its delicate beauty from the earth like the imagining of a happy vision. Viewed at a distance, its burnished dome resembles a half-disclosed balloon, as large as a cathedral, but light, brilliant, and seemingly ready to burst its band and stay aloft. In every sense, the Crystal Palace is admirable. A quote from Horace Greeley, writing in the New York Tribune, 1854. Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. I hope that everyone had a nice week. I unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, don't have any updates on the vampire-related things that have been happening around my apartment, or I guess I should say vampire warding-related things. You know, the garlic that our landlord put by the door, the holy water I found in the cabinet, etc. The only, I guess, two things this week is, one, I was thinking about it, and I realized this would be the perfect place for a vampire to hang out. Not my building, but the buildings around my building, because I've mentioned this in a previous episode, but back in 2019, the house next to ours burned down, and so there's just like a boarded up empty shell right next door that is now basically just like a place where a bunch of stray cats live. And then behind both the burned down house and the building we live in, there are a number of what I like to call murder sheds. So behind the house next to ours, there is a shed where the door often just like slams on its own in the wind, like whoever, when they left it, they forgot to lock it. So it's just a lot of the times I'll be sitting and working during the day and I'll look over and I'll, because I'll see movement, I'll just see like the door to that creepy shed slamming. And then in our backyard, which I've never been down into, the downstairs neighbors have access to the backyard, but we don't. But our backyard is a really creepy place. There's sort of like a deck and then the deck descends down some stairs and then there's these two like sheds that lead into each other that also are like dilapidated and falling apart and then the building on the other side of ours used to be a restaurant until covid hit and now is just abandoned because a bunch of restaurants in new york city and i assume around the country have closed down because of covid and that restaurant is one of them So, you know, if you were a vampire, it actually would be a great place to live, right? Because there's this weird abandoned building that's all boarded up on one side that, you know, is a total charred shell on the inside. After the firefighters came and managed to put out the fire before it spread to our building, which shares a wall, I did peek in and it's just like totally gutted. Though you couldn't really tell that that much but from looking at the outside. It's still like a pretty solid structure. So if you were a vampire and you wanted to take shelter, that would be a good place to do it. Or you could hang out in one of the many murder sheds. Or you could hang out at the closed restaurant, which has these wide windows all around the outside of the building. But since it closed down, it's been totally papered over with huge, I don't know, sheets of paper or whatever. So you can't see inside anymore. So, you know, I don't actually think there are vampires here, but if you were a vampire, I don't think you could find a better place to hang out and not be disturbed. So that's that. We're also moving apartments in a couple weeks, which is not related to vampires in any way. It's just related to rental prices having dropped a lot in New York City since COVID started. So now we can afford a bigger place. One thing I will say, though, is that when we told our landlord we were leaving, because we don't have a lease or anything, we're just month to month, so we can kind of leave whenever we want with just 30 days notice. So when we told our landlord we were leaving, he seemed genuinely sad that we were leaving, which makes me feel better because I was slightly worried that maybe he thought we were vampires or something. I know that sounds like an irrational thing to be anxious about your landlord thinking about you, but you haven't met my landlord. But, you know, we'll be moving into a newer building. Our building was built in the 1910s, and our new building was built in the 1920s. So, you know, it'll be the height of modern technology as of 1920, as many buildings in New York City are. So that's my vampire update. 
I'll let you guys know if there's anything else, though I kind of doubt there will be, especially since we're leaving this building pretty soon. But hey, you never know. So in speaking of buildings, especially buildings that perhaps have caught fire and burned down, today's topic is New York City's Crystal Palace, which is a piece of forgotten New York City history, I would say. And this week's episode is more history-focused, though there is a little bit of spookiness because the Crystal Palace was built on a cemetery or the site of a former cemetery. Before we get into the story of the Crystal Palace, I did want to acknowledge the main source that I used for this episode, which is the book The Finest Building in America, The New York Crystal Palace, 1853 to 1858 by Edwin G. Burroughs, which was published in 2015. Burroughs is the author of a couple extremely long books about New York City that I'm planning to read. I own the audiobooks of both of them, and they're each about 60 plus hours long as a listen, so I'll get to them eventually. But I wanted to make sure to mention this book, The Finest Building in America, right off the bat, because... I rarely rely so heavily on a source, like a single source in my episodes. Like if you ever look at the show notes, most of the episodes I do have like 40 plus sources. And while this episode has many sources, an enormous part of the arc and narrative of this story comes from this book. And as always, the full source list and show notes for this episode live at buriedsecretspodcast.com, so you can check all of that out there for this episode or any other. So some of you may have heard of the Crystal Palace, but it's most likely that you've heard of the Crystal Palace in London, which predated the Crystal Palace in New York. The Crystal Palace in London was an international sensation which is still pretty well known today. Like I remember for a Victorian literature course I took in college, I gave a presentation on the Crystal Palace because we had to give a presentation on something Victorian. So it was well known enough that I was excited to give a presentation on it because it was very easy to find information about it. Sadly, London's Crystal Palace no longer exists. It burned down in the 1930s, but it did survive much longer than New York's Crystal Palace did. So London's Crystal Palace opened in 1851 in the bucolic setting of Hyde Park. It had tons of green space around it, and it was just, you know, a really beautiful park and a beautiful place to build this palace made of glass. So the palace was constructed from plate glass and cast iron, and it had the most glass ever used in a building up to that point. These were really new building materials, and the technology to create sheet glass had only come about in 1832, so it really was groundbreaking. The building, the materials, all of that. The architect was a gardener named Joseph Paxton, who at the time that he submitted his design was the Duke of Devonshire's head gardener for the Chatsworth House estate. So if you've seen the Kubrick film Barry Lyndon, That estate was the filming location for Castle Hackton, or if you've seen the 2005 Pride and Prejudice movie, that estate was the filming location for Pemberley, Darcy's home. I've seen both of these movies, but I've seen Pride and Prejudice about 15 times more than I've seen Barry Lyndon. So of course, as soon as I saw the picture of the palace, I was like, oh, I know where that is in fiction. But anyway... Joseph Paxton was really interesting to me because at first I was wondering why on earth a gardener would be qualified to do a major architecture project. But I was wondering, you know, maybe he was an amateur or self-taught type, like a James Renwick Jr. type. Back in the 19th century, it wasn't so weird for someone to teach themselves architecture. But I looked up Chatsworth House and I looked up the improvements that Paxton made to its grounds And during his tenure there, Paxton did a ton of design and architecture type projects, including a rockery in a pond, a fountain that was built for a visit from the Tsar Nicholas I. They managed to build the fountain in only six months, and that meant they had to work around the clock. So they worked during the night using flares as light. And the idea was that it would be the tallest fountain in the world, which involved building a eight-acre lake on the moors above the house, 
so that they could get the right water pressure for the fountain. And the fountain's jets reached heights of 296 feet, so about as tall as a 21-story building. Unfortunately, the Tsar's visit never happened, and Nicholas I died about a decade later without ever having visited Chatsworth. But still, an impressive engineering feat from a gardener. Paxton also built a lily house, which is where the giant Amazon water lily was cultivated for the first time, as well as a set of greenhouses. One thing I wanted to mention about the greenhouses was that Paxton grew bananas there, specifically Cavendish bananas. They were named after the Duke of Devonshire, his employer, whose name was William Cavendish. Today, Cavendish bananas are the main type of bananas that are eaten all around the world. So if you've enjoyed a banana recently, you can thank Joseph Paxton. But most importantly for our purposes here, Paxton built the Great Conservatory, which was completed in 1841 and was the largest glass house in the world at the time. So back then, you couldn't get sheet glass bigger than three feet long, but four feet pieces were specially made for the conservatory. And since tropical plants were grown there, it had to be heated, which was accomplished with eight boilers and seven miles of iron pipe. There was also a carriageway in the center. And when the queen visited the estate, she would be driven through the conservatory and they would light the conservatory with 12,000 lamps. So that sounds really grand and beautiful and picturesque. Sadly, the conservatory, like the other buildings we're talking about today, is no longer around. It was really expensive to maintain and it wasn't heated during World War I, so all the plants died and the conservatory was demolished in the 1920s. But the conservatory was basically a testing ground for the Crystal Palace. So it makes a lot of sense, actually, that Paxton, a gardener, was hired for the job of building this Crystal Palace or designing this Crystal Palace because he had pioneered this new thing, you know, building out of plate glass. And the commission in charge of the Crystal Palace needed something built quickly and cheaply, and Paxton delivered. It took 2,000 men and eight months to build, and it cost less than 80,000 pounds. And just a side note, Remember all of this when I start talking about the New York Crystal Palace, right? This came in under budget, it was, or on budget, I guess, and it was built quickly. Visitors were stunned by how the building didn't need lights inside, since it was illuminated by sunlight that, you know, was shining through the glass. There were between 13,000 and 14,000 exhibitors from around the world. Six million people were admitted into the exhibition between May and October 1851, The palace was 990,000 square feet. It was so tall that it could contain full-grown elm trees. And the London Crystal Palace was heavily publicized in America, and journalists wrote articles praising it. So the Crystal Palace in London became such a big deal in the States that, in typical fashion, Americans decided that we needed one too. And of course, ours would be bigger and better, etc. The idea that many elites in American society, you know, like very wealthy people in America had, was that the American Crystal Palace would increase industrialization by making people appreciate and want manufactured products. A lot of people had really lofty sounding ways of putting it, but basically it sounds like they wanted to teach people consumerism, especially poor people. Some folks seem to think that young craftsmen could come and get ideas for new inventions and products, but for the most part, the American Crystal Palace seemed to be focused on civilizing or cultivating poor rubes who apparently weren't smart enough to know that they needed a bunch of useless stuff. A Unitarian minister named Henry Bellows, who preached to a wealthy congregation, had this to say about the exhibition. It was, quote, a great popular advertisement a plan for letting the people know what is to be had and who has it, a scheme for creating wants by exhibiting ingenious means of supplying them and thus developing new forms of labor and new markets for them. I just think this whole line of thought is really gross. I do love the idea of a crystal palace, especially since the U.S. didn't have big museums like we do now, and it would have been an opportunity for people to see great art and learn about interesting new technology. It's just that I find the motivations of some of the people in the Crystal Palace Association who led the charge to construct a Crystal Palace in New York City 
really despicable. It's important to remember also that there was a lot of civil unrest around the time, and this was a moment in history, much like nowadays, when the gap between the rich and the poor was widening by a lot. And wealthy people often spoke out about how they needed to suppress workers' rights and human rights movements, and poor people resented the people who were growing rich on their labor, while also looking down on the laborers who created their wealth. This was not an issue that was going to be solved by building a crystal palace, but maybe there's a metaphor or joke here about throwing stones in glass houses. I don't know. But at any rate, it was decided that New York would have its own crystal palace. So the first thing they needed to do in New York was to find a place to build it. The initial idea was that they would construct the Crystal Palace further downtown, kind of where Madison Square Park is now. So that would be like the East 20s, you know. But there were rich people who lived near there and they objected. If the whole point of this palace was to teach poor people to want things, that meant that poor people were going to come visit the palace and walk by these rich people's mansions, and they couldn't have that, God forbid. So instead, they put the Crystal Palace in what today is the heart of Midtown, but back then was an undeveloped area of muddy, empty lots. 42nd Street on the east side of 6th Avenue. You might remember this location from two past episodes. In the Victorian Egyptomania episode, I talked about the Croton Reservoir, which was a giant Egyptian revival structure that held clean water that came from upstate via the Croton Aqueduct. There was a promenade around the top that people would stroll around, but on the whole, it was apparently known as a pretty grim structure. It didn't really last that long, but it was this huge, imposing thing. And the other time that I've talked about this area is in the Potter's Fields of Manhattan episode, I talked about how they attempted to build a nice cemetery beside the reservoir, but the ground was swampy and gross and nobody wanted to buy plots there, so it became a Potter's Field. And most of the people buried there had died from cholera, pneumonia, smallpox, tuberculosis, and typhoid fever. So it was a location that was too crappy to have a cemetery there. Like, Rich people did not want to pay to be buried there because it was such an awful spot. But I guess rich people felt like it was a fine place to put this crystal palace. Why not? So the reservoir was where the main New York Public Library building, you know, the one with the lions in front and the one that was featured in Ghostbusters, stands now. And the Potter's Field was where Bryant Park is today. So if you've been to New York City, you've probably been to Bryant Park, and that's where this crystal palace was built. This was not exactly an auspicious beginning to be put in a swampy spot in the shadow of a reservoir where even a cemetery hadn't been able to flourish. It's also unclear exactly what happened to the bodies when the Crystal Palace was built. The book The Graveyard Shift, A Family Historian's Guide to New York City Cemeteries, says, The remains in the cemetery may have been removed to another burial ground in 1852 to make way for the Crystal Palace, an entertainment venue which opened on the site the following year. But it doesn't seem like anyone's totally sure that they moved the bodies. My guess, since it was a potter's field, is that the bodies were left there. That seems to be what they do to the bodies of poor people when they want to build something else on top. Which is something that I think most New Yorkers don't necessarily know or think about. I was actually just yesterday talking to a delivery guy who, when I was admiring a cool 19th century church in Astoria, he stopped by to talk to me about the church and we were kind of talking about history and, you know, what Astoria used to be like during the 19th century, etc. And he brought up cemeteries. I'm always very happy when a random person brings up cemeteries, so I don't have to be the first one to mention cemeteries. He brought up cemeteries and he was like, oh yeah, I heard that you're not allowed to build on top of cemeteries. And I was like, you know, you'd think that would be the case but never underestimate the greed of developers and the eagerness to build up New York City. But it was kind of funny that that came up and that he unprompted brought that up, a random guy on the street. So that's a fun little piece of synchronicity for us there. So anyway, back to the Crystal Palace. They had a location for this new temple of consumerism. Now they had to find an architect to design the building. A ton of famous architects submitted proposals for the building, but the winning design was by two foreign architects, a Danish man named George Cartensen and a German man named Charles Gildemeister. 
Curtinson had been one of the architects of Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen, which is still around today. I've been there. It's really cool. It seems like he is the kind of guy to come up with a really cool design for this building, and he did. However, things did not really go well with the architects. So first, the budget for the building was $200,000. Their plan called for a budget of $300,000. They claimed, though really it would have cost more than that, and it seems like maybe they probably knew that. But the Crystal Palace Association insisted on some cost-saving measures, which really hobbled the construction. So for example, there was supposed to be a basement level. That was important because, one, it would have elevated the whole building by six feet, allowing it to obscure the huge Croton Reservoir that was right behind the Crystal Palace, you know, looming. And two, it would have allowed for a beautiful fountain to be installed in the lobby. But the basement level was nixed to save money, and that really ruined the intended impact of the palace, which was now overshadowed by the hulking reservoir. The fountain was replaced by what was by all accounts, a truly hideous statue of George Washington. I honestly don't know how a statue could be as hideous as supposedly the statue was. There's so much stuff that people wrote about how awful this terrible statue was. And I just, you know, I've seen, you know, some engravings of it and stuff, but it sounds like maybe it looked like something a child had made. Like, it sounds like it was just garbage, basically made out of paper mache or something, you know? So, The architects were blamed for everything that went wrong with the construction, which took longer than planned and was more expensive than planned. But to me, it doesn't sound like it was really the architect's fault. Also, the architects were supposed to be paid $5,000, but they were only ever paid $4,000. Cartinson returned to Copenhagen in 1855, and he supposedly died penniless and forgotten there in 1857. And Gildemeister returned to Germany in 1857 and died there in 1869. Neither of their deaths were really remarked upon in the American press, which seems right, since during the opening ceremonies of the Crystal Palace and during other publicity, the architects were neither honored nor mentioned, really. It sounds like the group of wealthy men behind the Crystal Palace Association wanted to take all the credit and put all the blame on the architects, so I really feel for them in this situation. But to go back to the construction of the Crystal Palace, so while it was being built, people flocked there to watch. It was apparently a very grand site, even though construction wasn't going so well. Aside from the delays caused by arguments, cost-cutting, and mismanagement, there were other holdups, like a hailstorm that killed three workers and broke a bunch of windows and flooded the exhibition floor. Across the street from the Crystal Palace, an enterprising inventor named Waring Ladding began construction of a strange-looking structure called the Ladding Observatory. It was a large octagonal observation tower which had a 75-foot wide base and came to a small point at the top where it was only 6 feet wide. It afforded panoramic views of the area, which had never been seen before because, you know, this was prior to airplanes and stuff and really tall buildings. So at 27 stories tall, it was the tallest building in New York City and one of the tallest human-made structures at the time. The only taller structures were the Great Pyramid at Giza and some European cathedrals. So if you look at images of the New York Crystal Palace, you'll usually see the tall, pointy, ladding observatory beside it, so much so that people often thought it was part of the exhibition, even though it wasn't. It was just, you know, a opportunistic sideshow attraction sort of thing for people who were going to visit the Crystal Palace. They could also visit the observatory. That wasn't the only structure to pop up and capitalize on the crowds of visitors to the exhibition. There was a great quote from the New York Times at the time, which I want to read. There are crystal stables and crystal cake shops and crystal groggeries and crystal ice cream saloons. One woman has set up a crystal fruit stall at which oranges and bananas in every state of decomposition may be purchased. We noticed a dilapidated hovel on 6th Avenue, which was called by its proprietor the Crystal Hall of Pleasure. That cracks me up. And it also, also something about this just feels so contemporary to me, like contemporary to our time. This idea of like all this merchandising and, you know, it just makes me think of Disney or something. You know, everything has some sort of Disney logo or intellectual property on it. And it's funny to see this in the 19th century as well. You know, basically in real New York style, 
Everyone who could profit off the excitement over the palace did so and with gusto. The area around the Crystal Palace became somewhat seedy and plenty of people moralized about the state of the area, which, I mean, it was the outskirts of town anyway. What do they want? They intentionally put it in kind of a crappy part of town. They can't complain about it getting seedy. Whatever. So they built the Crystal Palace. All these tourist attractions popped up around it. Let's talk about what was inside the Crystal Palace. So there were 4,300 exhibits from 6,000 contributors who hailed from 23 foreign countries. The initial idea was that the American Crystal Palace would be way better curated and organized than London's Crystal Palace, which people had said felt cluttered and confusing. This is a pretty good illustration of, you know, the New York Crystal Palace in general. Its creators were always saying, we'll do everything better than they did in London, and then they did everything much worse. So, the exhibition in London had 30 categories of items, and the American exhibition, which was supposed to be simplified, had 31. They added a category for musical instruments. Some of the other categories included substances used as food, philosophical instruments, mixed fabrics, wearing apparel, and fine arts. Fine arts included at least 675 paintings, for example, so they really went hard on this. It was not pared down. Basically, the exhibition had a lot of cool things, though it also had a lot of junk. Here are some of the things that were displayed in the New York Crystal Palace. A map of the United States drawn by a public school student, stomach punks, a, quote, mechanical leech, bird cages, doorbells, wigs, fake diamonds, sugar tongs, ice boxes, clothes, and of course, much more. A New York Times reporter wrote, The mind becomes very quickly exhausted from the quantity of material crowded on the view and very soon produces additional physical lassitude. Today we saw many faint-looking and wearied persons looking sorrowfully around for some place to rest themselves. One visitor called it a wilderness of objects. Gas lights weren't installed until later in the summer, so a lot of things were so in shadow that you couldn't tell what they were, especially on the east side of the building, which the reservoir cast a huge dark shadow on until the afternoon. So it kind of defeats the purpose of having a clear glass building if it is then overshadowed by an enormous, much larger reservoir. Good thinking, guys. So even if you could see something, there often wasn't anyone who knew what it was or could explain it to you, and things weren't really well labeled. So you could just be walking around and see some kind of weird machine and be like, I guess it's a machine. Who knows what it does? There weren't many new inventions that hadn't been previously displayed or revealed elsewhere. Aside from an electric motor and an early typewriter called a typographer. Mostly, the exhibition was noteworthy just because there was so much stuff there. It wasn't really noteworthy for what the stuff was. Also, the machine arcade, where all the machines were held, got really loud, especially the part that had looms, spinners, and other textile manufacturing machines. It just sounds totally overwhelming. Also, and I don't think this is something that ended up happening, but the plan had been to display let's say, a man who was more than 100 years old, who had been enslaved and owned by George Washington. A writer from the London Weekly News wasn't impressed by the exhibition as a whole, and he wrote, what do you think of the showing up of a slave as an article of American manufacture? I'm hoping that person was just commenting on the idea of potentially exhibiting a person, but it's unclear to me, for sure. So I don't want to draw conclusions too early, but so far, as you can tell, the Crystal Palace is off to a very bad start. The motivations behind building the palace were bad, the construction was behind schedule, over budget, the logic behind the exhibits themselves seems to be just completely absent, But the Crystal Palace did have a really important impact. So until the Crystal Palace was built, for example, people in the United States vacationed in the countryside. It wasn't really a thing for people to go into cities to see the sights there. 
they were more focused on leaving cities to see the beautiful, peaceful, clean countryside. If they went into the city on vacation, it was only to transfer trains on their way to a more bucolic location. John Dahlberg, an English historian, writer, and politician who is famous for saying power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, had this to say of New York City at the time. There is little to be seen in New York. It is not a fine city. So basically, people might travel to cities like New York City for work, but they weren't going to go there as a tourist. There weren't really tourist attractions in the city as we understand them now. But all of that changed with the Crystal Palace. Suddenly, New York City was a destination for folks. So much like today, when all of the rich people left New York City in July and August, Tourists came in to see the Crystal Palace, and nowadays that's just kind of like accepted, right? Like if you're a certain kind of rich person or from a certain kind of like social class, you go out to like Montauk or whatever in New York for the late summer months or as many of those weekends as you can manage. And, you know, the rest of us are just stuck here in New York for the hottest months of the year while a bunch of tourists flock in. Well, this was the beginning of all the tourists flocking in. People were really excited to see the Crystal Palace. A 17-year-old Samuel Clemens, who would later be known as Mark Twain, went to the Crystal Palace and was totally transfixed. He had recently moved to New York, and he wrote his family back in Hannibal, Missouri, that it was, quote, a perfect fairy palace, beautiful beyond description. Walt Whitman, whose famous book Leaves of Grass would be published the next year in 1855, was a young poet from Brooklyn at the time, and he visited the Crystal Palace so many times that cops became suspicious and started following him around. He returned so many times because he wanted to look at a Danish statue called Christ and His Apostles, which people said was the best art at the exhibition. And lest you think that this obsession with the statue was out of religious devotion, Walt Whitman was very famously gay and... This statue was considered one of the most perfect sculptures of Christ in the world, etc. Meaning that it definitely fit into that sort of like sexy Jesus category of art, which like, I'm sorry, but that's definitely a thing. And I guess Walt Whitman was really into it. So moving on from the things contained in the palace, let's talk some more about some of the issues the palace had. You know, you might be wondering what happened to the Crystal Palace. This was such a beautiful and beloved structure that so many people went to see. Why isn't it still there? And as you could probably guess from what I said earlier in the episode, and also what you could probably guess if you've listened to many episodes of this podcast, the answer is that the New York Crystal Palace, like so many beautiful buildings, and the house next door to where I live, burned down. But this building didn't just burn down. After all, buildings are destroyed in fires all the time, especially back then. But their stories often survive. So why did people just sort of forget about the Crystal Palace entirely when it was such a huge cultural phenomenon? And why wasn't it rebuilt? So we talked about some of the issues that the Crystal Palace Association had. You know, some philosophical issues they had. We talked a little bit about their, you know, ill-fated budget. The Crystal Palace Association had financial issues from the very beginning. So in February 1854, stockholders learned that even though the association had earned $350,000 in ticket sales from the 1.2 million people who had visited the exhibition, they still owed their creditors $125,000. So that's about $3.8 million in today's dollars. They'd even had to mortgage the building. So the association got a new board of directors made up of 25 men who were mostly business magnates, bankers, and lawyers, though it also included Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune. Greeley was a real character. I find him delightful. He supported causes like socialism, vegetarianism, feminism, temperance, and of course, the abolition of slavery. And I know those are mostly pretty normal things to support nowadays, but back in the mid-19th century, that made you eccentric. Greeley was a kind of interesting choice for the board, I think, but he was a really important figure in New York at the time, so in that way, it makes sense that they wanted him on board. And in speaking of eccentric board members, Greeley had a friend who also made it onto the board, someone who was actually very controversial, 
one Phineas Taylor Barnum, a.k.a. P.T. Barnum, the famous showman. So that'll do it for this week. We'll pick back up next week and look at what P.T. Barnum did to try to save the Crystal Palace. We'll talk about the terrible fire that completely destroyed the palace, and we'll talk more about why people don't really remember the palace nowadays. You know, it survived in some engravings and, like, New York City history buffs know about it, but it's just not a super well-known thing these days. So come back next week for the rest of the story of the Crystal Palace and its terrible fate. In the meantime, you can check out the show notes at buriedsecretspodcast.com if you want to see the sources for this episode. I'll also put some engravings and images of the Crystal Palace in there. You can follow the show on Instagram at Buried Secrets Podcast. You can email me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, please tell your friends about it. Please rate and review. That'll help other people find out about the podcast. And thanks so much for listening. <laughs>